So um, I'm Helen Rolston and I'm currently a PhD student um, working at the IGN, which is the French uh, mapping agency. Um, but today I'm going to be presenting part of the work I did for my master's degree, uh, which I did at the University of Western Brittany in Brest, um, which is here in northwest France. So for my master's thesis, I studied a hydrographic campaign that took place in the middle of the 18th century um, in 1750 and 1751 um, to get an insight into the chain of production of hydrographic knowledge at that time. So I carried out this project doing a six month internship with the Nouvelle Aquitaine region and the project was financed by the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme d'Aquitaine and I worked alongside Nathan Godet, who's doing his PhD on the history of the French hydrographic service. Um, and that's because last year, the Hydrographic and Oceanographic Service of the French Navy, um, which is called the CHOM, celebrated its 300th anniversary. And so the CHOM today is the public authority for the maritime and coastal um, geographical reference information. And the CHOM's predecessor, which is the French Navy's map and chart depot, was created in 1720 in order to collect, analyse and compile the documents produced by the maritime community in order to construct nautical charts. Uh, one of the nautical charts that was produced by the depot is this one um, of the Bay of Biscay, produced in 1750 and drawn up by Jacques-Nicolas Boulin, who was a hydrographic engineer at that time. Um, so here on the on the chart, we can see on the right hand side the west coast of France and at the bottom is the north coast of Spain. Um, so once this map had been published, um, the depot quickly learnt that it was inaccurate thanks to feedback um, sent by people who had used it to navigate. And given the importance of this maritime region, it was decided that a hydrographic campaign should be carried out um, to verify and correct this chart and others of the same region, and to take measurements of the depth of the water at different points on the approaches to ports um, to be able to add that information to new charts. So this kind of measurement of the a depth of the water is called a sounding. And what we can see here are some um, sounding plummets. Um, so a plummet like one of these would be attached to the end of a long line of rope that would be thrown overboard um, and that would allow us to measure the depth of the water by measuring the length of the submerged rope. Um, and by adding some tallow to this cavity um, at the end of the plummet, um, when that touched the seabed, some of the sand or whatever sediment was making up the seabed um, would stick to the tallow. And then when we pulled up the plummet um, from the sea, we could um, inspect the composition of the seabed. So to be able to study the campaign um, in, in 1750 and 1751, um, we identified three different kinds of documents, um, which are now conserved at the National Archives of France and at the National Library of France. Firstly, there's the correspondence between the ship's crew and those on land, and that gives us information about the people involved, the scientific and technical operations carried out, and just the day-to-day -day life on board the ship. Secondly, there are the nautical charts, um, so those that need to be corrected and that they annotated with corrections, and those that were produced as a result of the campaign. And thirdly, there are the accounts of soundings. These are the large, um, these were just large notebooks um, that contained a record of every um, piece of information that they collected at each sounding point. Um, so during the mission, during the campaign, um, over 350 soundings were carried out in the bay um, using a sounding line with a sounding plummet um, to measure the depth of the water and to record samples of the seabed at different points. Um, so as you can imagine, what you can see here is just a small um, fraction of the archives that we studied in this project. So this is what the record for one sounding point looks like. Um, for every sounding point, quite a lot of different data were recorded. Um, and so this is the data that I um, manually transcribed into a spreadsheet. So first of all, we have the date. We have the time um, in true solar time, which I had to convert to UTC um, because um, um, I needed to make this conversion to UTC because of the calculation that I had to do on the depth of the water, um, because um, here is the depth um, measured during the campaign in fathoms, um, but the depth during the campaign, the, the depth measured, sorry, the depth measured during the campaign didn't take into account the effect of the tide on the water level, um, and so to be able to make do that calculation myself, I needed to have the correct time to then be able to get the correct historical tide prediction um, for that time and place. Uh, next, we have a description of the nature of the seabed, which could vary from just a couple of words to quite a long sentence. 
Um, then we have the latitude and the longitude. Uh, the longitude though was with respect to the meridian of Paris and not the Greenwich meridian. So we had to make that conversion as well. And then sometimes they also mention the landmarks that they use to calculate the coordinates. Um, so here we have the toponym of the landmark that they used, and the cardinal direction in which it could be seen from the ship. And sometimes they estimated the different distance from the ship in leagues. Um, and so sometimes there could be up to four, um, four landmarks mentioned in the, in the records of soundings. And sometimes the coordinates weren't recorded at all in the in the accounts of soundings, and that they would just make a note of the of the landmark um, of the landmarks and the bearings. And so, but that meant that I could then calculate myself where the sounding had been carried out. So after this process of transcription and conversion and standardization of the of the um, of the um, uh, the standardization, sorry, on the georeference. Um, of the data, I was able to create this animation that puts the campaign in its um, spatial and temporal context. So here, um, this animation is following chronological order and um, the red points represent each sounding point that was made during the campaign and the black squares are the ports where they um, where the crew stopped off to just to take a break or because they had to stop for bad weather reasons, for example. And, um, and so here we're just back in spring 1751 where they took off again um, so they were really only working um, during the good weather season um, so um, one of the things that i wanted to uh, achieve with this project was to be able to directly compare the data obtained obtained during the 18th century campaign with current data and the data i'm talking about here is the bathymetry so that's the depth of the water and the sedimentology which is the nature of the seabed for the bathymetry, the comparison was pretty straightforward after the depths had all been standardized, but for the sedimentology, it was a bit more tricky. Um, to be able to um, make the comparison between the historical and the current sedimentary data, I standardized um, and classified the historical data according to the current sedimentary classes in use by the Chom. And so this map we can see here is the worldwide sediments map, which is produced by the Chom and which is color coded um, color coded, sorry, according to the legend that you can see on the left, where each color represents a different class of sediment. Um, and so here is an example of um, a description of the seabed at one of the sounding points from the from the 18th century campaign. And as you can see, it's very rich in information. Um, this one in particular mentions sand, it mentions pieces of shell, um, small shells, even some coral and a bit of gravel. And so a description like this, as you can imagine, is quite difficult to fit into the very strict um, classes that are used by the Champ today. Um, so I developed um, a set of rules that I used to classify um, these rich descriptions um, according to the Champ sedimentary classes. And so these rules were often based on the size of the sediment. And so these rules worked really well for the most part, and they enabled me to classify um, most of the, almost all of the descriptions to the classes used by the Chom. And so it worked really well, well except for, for one example, which is this one. Um, so this description states that the seabed contained um, ground shell and small shells. And so with the rules that I developed, um, this would have been classified as sand and gravel according to the size of the elements, except that at the end of this description, it's written that the seabed contained neither sand nor gravel. And so although I found that quite amusing, um, I think it serves as a very good example um, that we really have to recognize that, especially when we're working with historical data, that no model is going to fit our data perfectly. So here is the result of the classification of the historical um, sedimentary data. Um, the base map here um, is the worldwide um, sediment map that we saw just before. And the legend on the left, um, the colors correspond to both the base map and these points. And so like with the previous map, um, each point represents one of the sounding points. And so the color um, of the points um, corresponds to the nature of the seabed that they found during that campaign. And so this allows us to make a direct um, comparison between um, the, the sediment um, that they that they observed in the 18th century and the current the current um, sedimentology of the seabed. Oops. 
So to conclude, um, first of all, this work has given us an insight into the workings of the chain of production of hydrographic data in France in the mid 18th century, um, which is absolutely intertwined with the art of navigating and the navigators themselves. Another major result of this project is the method developed for processing the historical hydrographic data, including the conversions and standardizations, and then the georeferencing um, to be able to visualize the data. And this method could absolutely be applied to events at other times in history and in other geographic spaces. And finally, this work has provided us, and particularly the Chom, with new information regarding the sedimentology and the bathymetry in the Bay of Biscay. Um, the data produced in this project extended the Chom's retrospective knowledge of the seabed by a century. And in the north of the Bay of Biscay in particular, um, given that the sediment is relatively stable, um, the data we've been able to extract from the historical archives has given us potentially the most detailed knowledge to date of the seabed in that area. Thank you very much for listening.